Good morning. Those who watch this TV program this morning, <clears throat> pray that you stay with us and be blessed by the preaching of God's Word. 1 Corinthians the Bible says that God chose the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. If you'll take your Bibles and open up to Matthew chapter 28 and verse 16. Jesus had a purpose for his Father in heaven to send him to this earth. Jesus' main priority was not to come and heal people and raise the dead and do the miracles that he did, even though they was there to help. His purpose was, as it says in Matthew chapter 1, to come and save his people from their sins. Sin will take us to hell. Sin will separate us from the Father in heaven. And sin will separate us eternally from the Father in heaven in the lake of fire called hell. That's why Jesus came. It took such a great sacrifice. It took such great love that man cannot comprehend to come and lay his life down on the cross for the world, for all mankind, so that he can give every man and woman the opportunity to be saved from their sin, to escape hell and make heaven their home. That's exactly what Jesus did. From the time that he, his ministry on earth till the time that he went back to heaven, he gave every man and woman the opportunity between now until he comes back the second time or you take your last breath in this life to get your sins washed away and prepare yourself for an eternity with Him. Now, the time of the apostles in the early church, the gospel went out through the whole world. Every ear heard, every living thing heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. Today, the gospel is still going throughout the whole earth, throughout the whole world, being preached. Every man and woman is getting the opportunity to have their sins washed away, and to be saved from spending the eternity in a lake of fire to spend an eternity with an almighty and loving God. In Matthew chapter 28, starting with verse 16, Jesus had already died and was buried and had already risen again according to the Scriptures. Jesus had already Took it, taken his life. There were twelve disciples, now there's eleven, whom would be apostles. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto him, saying, All power or all authority is given unto me by God the Father in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, or make disciples out of every person, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, or the Holy Spirit. And after they had baptized those who would, he said, teach them. Teach them again. Teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world, or the end of the age." The disciples were commanded by Jesus to go to every person. Every ear was to hear the gospel, the teaching. And for those who gladly received the teachings of the apostles, they were baptized. They became Christians. They became the child of God. And once they come up out of that watery grave of baptism, they immediately were to be taught again all the New Testament scriptures. Yes, they were to grow in, as from a baby into manhood or womanhood in Christ. And as they grow, they were to learn more and more about the scriptures. And they, they were to become wise unto salvation. 
That's what the apostles taught in Acts chapter 2. Let's turn over there. The opening day of the church, the church and the kingdom of God are one of the same thing. And on the opening day of the church, the day of Pentecost, the day that the power of God, the Holy Spirit, came down upon the apostles. Now, they already had the ability. If you read Matthew chapter 10, verse 1 through 5, they already had the power to heal the sick and heal the diseases and raise people from the dead. But they didn't have the power to speak with one language all the languages there were upon the earth. Well, they received that power on the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit came down from heaven and sat upon each of them like a, a cloven tongues of fire. And they each had the ability now to speak in one language every language that they were on the earth. And so did they. And they used those, uh, that uh, language. It was done miraculously because when they spoke, it was the Holy Spirit speaking through them. And there were Jews out of every nation under heaven there that day. And they preached unto the Jews, God's chosen people first. And then they went unto the Gentiles, every other nationality. And Peter preached and the apostles preached unto the Jews, the same ones who stood outside Pilate's hall when Pilate was speaking unto Jesus to see if he had done anything wrong or not. Pilate did not find anything wrong. So he was determined to let Jesus go free. But God's own people, the Jews, they cried out, crucify him, crucify him. Let his blood be on us and on our children. Peter and the apostles preached to those same Jews. And he told them, you're the ones that had the Son of God killed, slain on the tree. You're responsible for that. And when they heard that, they were pricked in their heart. They were convicted. And they asked Peter and the apostles, what must we do? And Peter and the apostles told them all, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ in Acts 2.38. For the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says that they that gladly received the word were baptized. They obeyed the gospel. And they were added unto the 3,000. About 3,000 were added unto the church or the kingdom of God that day. And there's something they continued in. See, they were taught, the apostles were taught by Jesus, the Jews were taught by the apostles, and the Gentiles would be taught by the apostles. And every man and woman, all the peoples of the world, from today until Jesus comes back, will be taught by the apostles. Because it says in Acts 2.42, that the early church, they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine or teaching and in fellowship and breaking of bread and in prayers. They continued in what the apostles taught. The apostles taught these people. And they didn't only teach the people in Jerusalem, but they went to every city upon the earth. You see, every time they baptized someone into Christ, they became a Christian. And then they were able to go and teach. And then when they baptized people, they became Christians. Then they would be able to go and teach. And for you know, there were thousands of Christians upon the earth in those days. And they went forth into the whole world preaching the gospel. And the Bible says in those days, in Galatians chapter 1, that every year heard the gospel. There was none left out. I don't care who it is. You can even say the natives in the far out African countries out in the jungles where no one goes. I'm telling you that they heard the gospel and rejected it. Today we are continuing hearing the gospel. We are continuing hearing the teachings of the apostles. Back in the early church, not only did the apostles go forth from every city, they just stayed in one place. They moved continually.
to different places until they covered the whole earth. They even had evangelists like Timothy and Titus. In Titus chapter 1, if you'll turn over there with me, please. <clears throat> Titus chapter 1, in verse 1. Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness in hope of eternal life which God that cannot lie promised before the world began but hath in due times manifested his word his teaching through preaching which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior and I'm telling you today we still have the commandment to preach and teach God's word or the apostles doctrine to Titus, my own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I have appointed thee. Yes, the evangelists, they continued in the apostles' doctrine, and they went forth teaching the apostles' doctrine, setting the church in order, you see, and we're still doing that today as the apostles taught it. Setting the ch church in order. We today as the Lord's church, and if you're not a Christian, the opportunity is still there. Jesus still has the door wide open to the church, the kingdom of God. It's open for anyone, whosoever will. Come and let them partake of the water of life freely, like the Bible says. You see, yeah, God's love, He loves the whole world because John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. God did His responsibility. His love is not unconditional. It's conditional, you see, because you cannot receive the love of God without doing what He says. Apart from obeying the gospel, apart from obeying God's commands which are written in His Word, you cannot receive the love of God. It is conditional. In Romans chapter 12, we read this earlier. God has set forth rules and conditions and there's power in them. They're not just there to uh, say, we have to obey God. They're there because there's power in them. God sees to it that there's power in them. When we do what He says, He makes the changes in our life. We're saying to Him, Lord, I'm willing to let You take over my life. I'm willing, willing to let You <clears throat> fill my mind with Your words so that what I say will be words of righteousness. I'm willing to let You fill my body and so that the things that I do will be things of righteousness. That's what we say when we're baptized into Christ. That we're willing to let the Lord take over. And that's what He wants. The Lord wants to take over our lives. Yes. He wants to take over our life. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. For the Christian... Paul said, I beseech you therefore, brethren. Brethren, he's talking about Christians in Christ. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. You see, God did, in John 3, 16, God did His part because He gave. In the latter part of that verse, it says, whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God did His part by giving. We do our part by presenting our lives unto Him as a living sacrifice, you see. That's something that we have to do. When we come out of that water grave of baptism, our minds should have been settled at that time that I'm going to be a disciple of Christ. I'm going to present my body a living sacrifice unto Him. I'm going to let Him mold me and make me. I'm going to let Him guide me. 
He's going to be my leader. I'm going to do what he says. Yes, it's not such a bad thing, okay, in obeying the commands of our God. Because our commandments are not, the commandments are not grievous, says in John. His commandments are not grievous, but they lead unto eternal life. I'm telling you, there's not a thing in this world today ever has been or ever will be. Not a thing. There's no amount of money, no amount of power. There's not a thing in this world today that can lead you to eternal life except for the commandments of God. And I'm telling you, when we look at the commandments of God in that light, it ought to be sweet and joyous to us. We, I don't know about you, but I like banana pudding. And there's certain candy bars that I like. I like sweet things sometimes, you see. And I love it when I put it in my mouth and it dissolves in there. I just enjoy it so much. I'm telling you, when we study God's Word and we see His commandments like, uh, there, it ought, like, it ought to be like putting ice cream and cake in your mouth. And you should be enjoying it because they're going to lead you to eternal life. You see, when you die or Jesus comes back. You know, moms and dads, it used to be that when their children did wrong, they would punish them in whatever way they did. Not to be mean, but to help them to be free from going to prison one day. Help them be free from drugs and alcohol. Help them free from being murderers and all that evil is. That's why we spank our children. That's why we correct our children. So that when they grow up, they won't be mixed in all that garbage. You see? We're doing it to help them. It's a blessing for them. So it is that our Father in heaven, we're His children. And He gives us commands to abide by because they're not grievous. They lead to eternal life. Paul said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. And he's talking about this from head to toe. Your body ought to be used as a living sacrifice unto God. Hold your place in Romans chapter 12 and <clears throat> let's go to Romans chapter 10. And let's start at um, verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe on him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And it, the preacher is not talking about the preacher standing behind the pulpit. It's talking about every Christian, both man and woman alike. And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. You see, when we go and tell people about Jesus, how they have to obey Him, His commands, our feet are considered how beautiful they are. You see? Our feet carry the commands of God to the lost people so that they can be saved. In Ephesians chapter 5, 6, if you'll turn over there with me, please. <clears throat> Starting with verse 10. Paul said, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to, be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness 
And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And we talked about that in Romans chapter 10. Above all, take in the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Also in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Starting in verse 12. The Bible uses the analogy that our bodies, each member has a body and it makes up the body of Christ. And how we present our bodies a living sacrifice. For as the body is one and hath many members, okay, this body's got fingers, hands, arms, ears, nose, eyes, toes, feet, and etc., etc., for as the body is one has many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so is Christ. And we make up the body of Christ. You are a member. This person is a member. This person is a member. This person is a member. One person is the feet. One person is the arms. One person is the eyes. And we make up the body of Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body whether it be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were a hearing, where were the smelling? But now has God set every mem members, every one of them, in the body as it has pleased Him. And we need to notice that. God sets every member in the church, in the body of Christ, as it has pleased Him. And if they all were one member, where will the body be? But now are there many members, but yet one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee nor again the head to the feet. I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor. And our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. But our comely parts have no need. But God has tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor unto the part which lacked that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it, or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and members in particular. We told the Lord when we come up out of that watery grave of baptism that we're going to let Him have control. That He's going to be the potter, and we're going to be the clay. And he's going to mold us and make us what he wants us to be. And we need to continue to still do that today, even though we're grown from a babe in Christ into an adult in Christ. We need to continue doing that. Back in Romans chapter 12. Verse 1. Paul said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. What he means, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, that you allow your bodies to be used by God. We are God's spokesmen. When we speak, we're speaking for God. When we speak His Word, when we do things, whatever it is, with our feet, our arms, our eyes, our ears, when we do, when we see, when we hear things, we use it to glorify God with, for His purpose. Romans chapter 8, the Bible says that all things work out to the good for them that love God and is called according to His purpose. You see, the Christian belongs to God. 
We are not our own anymore. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, in the last two verses says, Know ye not that you are the temple of God that is in you, that God gave us? You have been bought with a price. You therefore are not your own anymore. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit which are His. The Bible's full of it. And if we're studying God's Word, we can't help but see what God is instructing for you and me to do. To please Him. We are to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy. We're holy because the blood of Jesus makes us holy only. We're not holy in ourselves. We're an acceptable unto God. Because we are covered by the blood of Jesus, God looks at you and me as He does His own Son, Jesus. Because the Bible calls us sons and daughters of God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, in the last verse, He calls us sons and daughters of God because of the blood He sees us. Then he goes on to say, which is your reasonable service. God does not expect you and me to do the impossible. Okay? <laughs> you and I are not going to be perfect like God until we get out of this world. There is no way you and I are getting out of this world until we die. You see? There's no way you and I are going to leave this world and be with God until we die. There's no other way. And so, he gives us in his word, he teaches us, see, we don't have to worry about being perfect. We don't have to be worried about having doing things that is beyond our reach and our ability. We don't have to worry about being something that we can't be. You see, because the Bible says that if we will present our bodies a living sacrifice, other, way, other words, let him have his way with us, that would be our reasonable service. He would accept that. Okay? God will accept that. You know, some people, I used to do this. I used to worry. I'm not as good as that Christian or that preacher, so therefore I'm not as pleasing to God. You see? I used to worry about that. But I don't anymore. Why? Why don't I worry about that anymore? Because I searched the scriptures and God himself told me that I didn't have to be that way. In the body of Christ, not everybody is a head and not everybody is a foot and etc. We have all been given our certain gift that we're good at by God himself. Now he doesn't expect you to use my gift. He expects you to use your gift. And he expects me to use my gift. And when we do that, we can be comfortable with it knowing that that's our reasonable service. Why? Because God sets on His Word. We can read that. Verse 2, And be not conformed to this world. Heck, when I accepted Jesus Christ, when I obeyed the gospel and repented was baptized, I left that old J. Jones behind. I crucified him. He I no longer exists. The living that J. Jones used to live no longer exists in J. Jones. I'm a new man. I'm a new creature of Christ. I have a new life now. I live in a new way. I don't live that way anymore. But I'm not to go back to that. You see, I'm not to look back in life and say, them were the good old days. I'm not to refer back to my old life unless it's going to help someone See that no matter what you've done, you can still come to the Lord. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. It all takes place right here. You know, I don't care what kind of shape your body's in. God doesn't either. As long as you're taking care of it the best you can. He can still use you. We sang a song. You may be old and weary and tired and out of strength, but you know what you still can do? You can go to the throne of God and still pray for yourself, for your other brothers and sisters of Christ, the preacher, the elders, and the lost people that haven't come to Christ. You can still pray. You can still do that, you see. There's a battle taking place. 
God is trying to influence us to come His way. And Satan is trying to influence us to come His way. Now God has all, is all powerful. His, he's more powerful than the devil. The Bible says back in John that greater is He that's in you than he that's in the world. Greater is He, the Godhead that's in you than the devil. But you see, that power does not work unless we put it to use in our lives. Unless we use it. Unless we accept it and use it. It does not work. That's why he said, Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Your mind, your thoughts should be changed. We should not think like we did back when we were not Christians. We should be thinking like Christians. And we have example from uh, uh, the early church until now. We have Christians that set examples that show the thoughts that please God. You see? Some people will take a glass of water and it's half full and say, well, that's half empty. You see, that's not positive thinking. It's half full. It's not half empty. And when we look into the Word of God in our lives, we should not allow anybody to cut us down. We shouldn't cut ourselves down. Because we're sons and daughters of the Most High God. And we should let God's Word fill us. It, it's our responsibility to get in God's Word and let it fill us, you see. I'm going to eat dinner here in a little bit. And it's going to be food that I like. And it's going to start a little bit and it's going to just fill my belly up until it's full. Well, that's where it should be with God's Word with you and me. We shouldn't just read a little, open it up once in a while. We should take it, read it, and study it, and it begin to fill us up all the way to the top. Our cup runneth over until we're full. That's what God's talking about. Be not conformed, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove. Now, see, He's given us another responsibility here. That you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You see? Prove it in your own lives first and then prove it to others. That's what he wants. Yeah, we have to prove ourselves. I used to say I don't have to prove myself to anybody because I thought I was cock of the walk. But God changed my mind on that. I do have to prove myself to him if I want to go to heaven. If I don't want to go to heaven, I want to go to hell, I, don't, I, won't, I won't bother proving myself to him. But we do. We have to prove ourselves unto God. In uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, if you'll turn over there with me, please. <clears throat> and verse 15. <clears throat> when we prove ourselves... You don't have to prove yourself to me. The husband wants to prove yourself to his wife, wife to the husband. But we do have to prove ourselves unto God. Study to show thyself approved unto God. How do we prove ourselves to God? Well, the Bible says in Romans 12 that we present our bodies a living sacrifice unto Him, wholly acceptable unto Him. Timothy writes that we're to study to prove ourselves unto Him. It don't come any other way. And I'm telling you, when we stand before God on Judgment Day, we're either going to be standing in front of Him, approved of Him, or not. God has given every person as well as the lost. The lost people that are not Christians yet, God has still given them time to obey the gospel before it's too late. In the church, God has given every Christian time to prove themselves unto Him. Have you done that? Have you proved yourself unto God? Well, one might say yes. Well, I would ask the question, have you presented your body a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto Him? Have you studied to show yourself approved unto God? These are the words of God. These are the commands of God, and they're not grievous. It's time for the church to quit looking at God's commands. Time for the church quit looking at the Bible 
It's time for the church to quit looking at other Christians in a negative way. But look at them as God's commands. You see, they're not grievous. They lead to eternal life. There's no amount of money and riches in the world or power in the world. There's nothing in this world that is any greater than eternal life with God the Father. And yet, by the same token, there is no money, no power, anything in this world can lead you there other than the commands of God, which are written in the Word of God. Study to show thyself unto proved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, but rightly dividing the Word of truth. Not every Christian can be a preacher or an elder, Sunday school teacher. I'm telling you, them is not the only works that are in the kingdom of God. There are many works in the kingdom of God. And I'm telling you, every Christian has a special gift from God that you do very well, better than anybody else. That's what God wants you to do. He wants you to present your body, liver, and sacrifice using the gift that He has given you to help others. You see, it may not be that we always have to talk to someone about the plan of salvation. It may be other things. You know, maybe they need someone to listen to them. Maybe they got other problems in their life that, that you can, you can uh, give good advice on. But maybe there's, uh, you know, may, maybe you know a little bit more about babies than uh, someone else does and they don't know how to take care of the problem. They come to you. You can help them, maybe help them, teach them how to uh, take care of that problem. Everybody has a talent, a gift from God. We're all members of the body of Christ. We don't have the same gifts. And we are to present our bodies a liquid sacrifice unto Him, holy and acceptable. You see? We're to study to show ourselves approved unto God. We need, the last thing is, we need to be ready. Peter says we need to be ready to give an answer to them that ask us for the hope that's in us. I say unto you this morning, for the Christian, God's word is not hard to understand. There was a um, survey taken once, you several years ago, and the preacher went about asking people, "How much time do you sp uh, spend studying the Bible?" After the survey was done, he concluded that. Most people studied the Bible little or none at all. No wonder people don't know the Word of God. No wonder people aren't receiving blessings from God. No wonder we can't tell people about Jesus. No wonder we have to uh, uh, reference to other things, say other things. I'm telling you, if we will take God's Word and study it, the Holy Spirit that you have when you were baptized... He will help you understand God's Word if you just won't give up. If you don't throw in the towel, just keep right at it. And I'm going to tell you something. The first time that you're part of leading someone to Christ, and that person is baptized into Jesus Christ, it'll melt your heart. It'll be one of the greatest joys you've ever known because you took the time to study God's Word and know what to tell that person, the truth. This morning, if you're not a Christian, the Bible says you need to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. By believing that message, one repents. Repentance is a change of mind and conduct. You turn away from your old ways of living and you turn towards God. The Bible says one must be baptized by immersion to have your sins washed away and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit or the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Not to help you speak in tongues and do miracles, but help you live a faithful life unto Jesus and His Word unto the end. If you are a Christian this morning and God's Word is pricking your heart as it has been preached, and the Holy Spirit is nudging at your heart, and you know that you've not been doing what we've just been taught from God's Word, it's sin, my friend. Sin is simply disobeying God. It's not just adultery and being a murderer and all that evil stuff. Sin is disobeying God, His commands.
And you need to repent. You need to change your mind and conduct towards that and turn from it. Confess your sins in 1 John 1, 9. Confess your sins to Jesus, not man. And it says he is just and he's faithful to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We're renewed back. You see, we're covered by the blood again. We can still walk with the Lord.